I'm Andrew. I recognise a few of the, the names that are coming up on the list, so thanks for coming. We're going to be talking today about pesticide selection for resistance management. And we're going to do this in a practical sense, but we are going to cover some theory which has a complex basis. So I'm hoping that I've hit the target in terms of summarising the complexity in a nice way. There is a little bit of a lag time. Sorry, so hopefully it moves to the next slide here. Um, just there, and hopefully I haven't gone twice. Yes, okay. The overview of this is pretty basic. We're going to cover the very briefly the project in which these webinars is just a small part. Then we're going to talk about mostly this webinar is about the pesticide resistance, how it occurs during management, as I've said, and we're going to point through the workshop to where you can get additional information and we'll we'll jump over to some websites and hopefully nothing crashes. Okay, so we're just waiting here for the next slide. Apologize for the delay. It is a considerable delay. Hello, where are we? Okay, so the brief summary of the project. Here it is. So the title of the project, you can see the first dot point and really we are providing fact sheets, pest management plans, we're completing diagnostic tests. So you can send us sick plants and we'll run tests to either work out what the problem is or at least rule out certain pests or pathogens um, by looking at the plant in detail and running various tests. Okay, so the education, that's where this webinars fit in and I know a fair number of you have been to at least some of the workshops that John and I have uh, conducted over the years. We're providing biosecurity support to NGIA, which is really more of a, of a whole of industry sort of thing. It's not really important to your day-to-day -day business the way the fact sheets and pest management plans potentially are. So what we're going to do is just briefly jump to the FMS website because I'm aware that a lot of people haven't necessarily seen this. So it's pretty simple. It's just nursery production, fms.com.au. There is a lot of information here. The search button is up here in the top right corner. Where our fact sheets are here is in the technical information. And we're just going to navigate there, hopefully, yet. Yeah. So then there are a lot of different topics, whether that be pest diseases, irrigation, growing media. So make use of this. It's all in the one place. The NGIA website has a lot of the same information. I find that this FMS website sort of packages it a little bit nicer because it's only really doing one thing, whereas NGIA website has other aspects to it. Okay, so let's head back to the webinar. All right, so this is the, just you'll get it in a moment. This is the overview of our more detailed view of the, the webinar. We're going to cover, first of all, what is pesticide resistance, how it occurs, and some Differences that you might observe, so a natural resistance versus pesticide resistance, sorry, natural tolerance versus pesticide resistance. So we probably all have a basic idea of what pesticide resistance actually is. And that is basically a reduced sensitivity to a pesticide. And what that simply means is they're not killed. Or, they can, and the, the level to which 
they have that reduced sensitivity at a population level sort of is the way you would describe the level of pesticide resistance. So you can have a high level of pesticide resistance or a relatively low level of pesticide resistance. Pretty basic. Um, I'm probably all familiar with that. Can you just raise your hand if you, you're familiar with, with these concepts? Um, so that way I can spend a little bit more detail if, if, if required. And just while you're doing that, I'm going to pop to the next screen and open this link here. Oops. Okay, so most people are pretty familiar with that. I think that that's that's good. Now, as I was trying to depict this in a visual fashion, I found the the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee website and I looked at it and just said, I can't do this any much any better. They're the they're the experts really. So I'm just gonna play the first minute of this video. I'm not sure how the audio is gonna go, but what I'll do is I'll hit the subtitles so you can see it. Can you hear it? Look, I can't even hear it. What? No, I, I can't hear it either, Andrew. Um, well, you can you can you can read it and you can view it, and we're only going to do the first minute anyway. So he's always used the same pesticide. He's worried about his crop, spraying his fields, not killing many of the insects. You can read it. Not as good as when was um where did I Okay, so there's natural variation. Put the so the shields are the resistant ones, the application goes on, and it kills the ones that are susceptible, but the ones that are resistant stay. Insects reproduce and fill the field with resistant individuals. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, pause, apologize for the lack of sound there. Um, that's showing my uh, technical uh, difficulties. <laughs> anyway, all right. So resistance provides advantage to the individuals when there is the selection pressure there. So when you apply lots of pesticides, there is an advantage, obviously, to have the pesticide resistance. When a pesticide is not being applied, there's obviously no selection pressure, there's no advantage to having the pesticide resistance. And in fact, there sometimes can be a negative impact to the pesticide resistance. So having whatever trait that leaves the individual free from harm of the pesticide that's being applied can actually have a negative impact compared to individuals that don't have that resistance trait. It's sort of a tricky concept to get your head around and we'll talk about it more later on when we're looking more details at the mechanisms behind pesticide resistance. But the main message I wanna get across here is that resistance in a population can sometimes disappear. And that's simply from interbreeding. interbreeding. So if you have resistant individuals reproducing with susceptible individuals, then their offspring in most cases are susceptible. Is that a concept that people are, are familiar with? You can just raise your hand if you're familiar with that concept of resistant and susceptible individuals breeding and effectively making susceptible offspring. Okay, we've got a few people raising their hands, a few more, that's great. 
All right. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll keep on going and hopefully it will become more clear through the talk. All right, so resistance and tolerance, and it will come, on, come up on your screen in a moment, are slightly different. And you all have experienced this, I would imagine, to some degree. Pesticide resistance has the genetic basis. It's heritable, as we've said, whereas tolerance is not based on genetics as such. It just simply re represents an innate ability for those individuals to survive. And it's really, the crux of it is without prior exposure. So there's something about that individual which makes it so that it's not susceptible. And you'll have experienced this with large individuals. So let's say very large caterpillars can be quite difficult or quite tolerant of, let's say, a, a BT application. Who, who's experienced something like that? I'm just going to uh, unraise everyone's hand. And if you've experienced something like that, let's say, or scarab beetle larvae, very small scarab beetle larvae, quite easy to manage with pesticides, but the larger individuals, they simply have an innate ability to withstand just about any product. So a couple of people have seen that. So as everyone else, when they spray, I'm assuming everyone sprays pesticides. Does anybody, let's, I'm just gonna unraise your hands again. Does anybody not spray any pesticides? Oh, there was a quick right hand, hand down, Tony. Uh, um, does anyone not spray pesticides? Spray pesticides. Okay, so, so everyone sprays pesticides and that's normal from time to time or sometimes more often it is a normal part of management of a business uh, a production nursery okay so in addition healthy well fed insects which are typically ones that's are present in a production nursery because you're producing wonderfully lovely healthy plants and the insects love that sort of thing they are a little bit more tolerant to pesticides than one that's let's say feeding on a host that isn't ideal for it or under environmental conditions that are stressful that sort of thing so if there's some stress it's just like people if you're stressed or in some way, let's say I have a nutrient deficiency, you're more likely to have a, a problem with a disease. Okay. All right, so we're gonna, put, John, can you put up this next poll? Who has experienced oh, pesticide resistance? Sorry, John, I took over from you. You go ahead. That's, that's quite all right, Andrew. You're doing rather well. Yes, so who has experienced pesticide resistance, <laughs> resistant populations in their production nursery setting? So if you've sprayed something, say aphids or thrips, and you just haven't been able to control them, um, it could be due to resistance. So if you have, um, yes, if not, um, yeah, just click no. Just give us an idea of if there is any issues mm -hmm. out there. Uh, we and for on. those people who are... Sorry, John. For those people who are hitting, because it looks like a fair number have, can you please chat, uh, type in your message to John, which species you, or the type, the group of pests at least, that you've had difficulties with? Okay, so we'll John, close is that coming there? Through? Yep, and we'll share. And sh sh uh, thank you. So. Two thirds at least have had issues with um, potential resistance, I guess, um, whereas only a third or just over a third haven't. So there is issues out there and it is mindful to keep keep that in um, what you actually do in the back of your head. So you may need to alter chemistries or do something different to try and combat that. Okay. And John, what's, what's come through? I think the... Uh... Um, we have, thrips, people have suggested. Cabbage, yeah, thrips have been an issue. 
for a couple of people, white fly, um, even cabbage moth. Um, cabbage mm -hmm. moth can be a mm -hmm. big problem because that we even have that issue in the production vegetable regions in southeast Queensland and other areas as well. So, thrips, mealybugs. So it looks mm -hmm. like thrips seems to be the top of the mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, western flower aphids. thrips, onion thrips. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they do okay. have an aphid. Excellent. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. No All worries. right. So this that that's the end of this section, which is probably shorter than the next. Do we have any questions? Please, if you have any questions, type them through to John. We do. And we, we can have discuss a, them now. Uh, am I still on? Yes, you um, are. We did have a comment from one grower that he selected no in that poll because it was often hard to guess if the population is yes. resistant or the pesticide application has been unaffected from uh, because of other issues. So whether it's application has not been right or conditions have just not been favourable for its effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I guess I guess okay. there is a fine line. So. What I would suggest in those sorts of cases that it's probably safe to assume that pesticide resistance isn't there and look for a reason for the application to, to not have been effective. Look at your records. Has the application rate been appropriate? Was the equipment calibrated? Was it being mixed when it was supposed to be mixed? Was yeah, was it, did it rain right afterwards or did the irrigation go on straight afterwards when it was supposed to be turned off? Ask those sorts of questions that can cause an application to fail. And then if those questions are all in favor of the application working and you've had success with that product, on that host plant with presumably the same species of insect, then you can start to suspect that perhaps you're dealing with pesticide resistance. Does that, does that make sense as to why I would take that approach? What do you think, John? Uh, um, sorry, I was just answering somebody in the process of your talking. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, uh, we do actually. We have some comments. Um, what was it? Uh, check to see if the mode of action of the chemical um, to the pest yes. is suited. So that is yes. very important. Um, That's and right. That goes down to reading the label properly as well. Yes. And if you're dealing with a, a species or a group of pests, let's say thrips, for example, is a pretty good example where you have two or more, mainly it's two species that can be, that have a propensity for pesticide resistance. So western flower thrips, onion thrips, I think there probably are a couple more. In those cases, you may well be it may have be a value to send those thrips to uh, us or to another entomology service to have it identified so that you can potentially put on a pesticide that is more suited to that species. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does, I'm not really getting any raised yeah. hands. Yeah, thrips are a really good one for that because some thrips are more um, sensitive to one yeah. particular chemistry than others. Uh, yes. No, All right. no well, do we questions. have any other... might keep going. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. The next section of the webinar is on 
pesticide, fungicide mode of action, looking at how the pesticide interacts with the organism and how the organism has sometimes overcome that mode of action. Right, so this is where it can get a little bit complicated. Because we have insecticides that are often working on the nerve cell, we have to know some basic nerve biology. And the picture sort of looks a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna break it down with this section up here. So a normal nerve pulse moves, you have little sensory organs perhaps, or other nerve cells connecting to this cell body. The stimulus from the outskirts of that cell body, they're interpreted in this section. And if that stimulus is sufficient, it will cause a nerve pulse to move down the axon to the axon terminal and then connect up to more cell bodies. And the way it happens is quite complicated and we're not gonna go into those details, but where we are gonna go into some more details because it's important to understand this from a pesticide mode of action point of view is the connection between nerve cells. What happens is the nerve pulse comes down here, comes to the very end, it causes neurotransmitters. We've probably all heard that word, neurotransmitter. And really it's just a communication. It's like picking up your phone, going your one nerve cell, you pick up your phone, you dial the number, and hopefully you connect to the other person on the other end. It transmits that nerve pulse to the next person. Right. So the new neurotransmitter comes out the end of the axon, it jumps this very, very tiny gap, microscopic. Those neurotransmitters then bind to receptor cells on the other side, which would be effectively up here, okay? Once the, those neurotransmitters attach to the receptors, it can cause the pulse to continue down the next nerve cell for the, for the, but it needs, it, may, it needs to be able to do this on multiple occasions. So what happens is an enzyme comes along and detaches the neurotransmitters from those receptor cells so that more neurotransmitters can come along and have the process be repeated. Please raise your hand if you understand. Now, actually, raise your hand if that doesn't make sense. Okay, I'm not getting any raised hands, so I'm going to assume that I was successful. Thank you. Now, there are two types of nerve poisons. There are poisons, uh, pesticides, that affect the axon they will in some way disrupt the nerve pulse going down the axon so it doesn't even get to the axon terminal and it then will stop normal nerve signaling. And then there are other poisons that act in the synapse, which you've probably all heard that one. The synapse is the connection that we've just talked about with the neurotransmitters jumping the gap, attaching to the receptors, and then being detached from the receptors to be able to have it continue. The exact mode of action is different for a lot of different pesticides, but the sort of thing that can happen, uh, we will actually, I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump backwards. We're going to talk about it in a moment in more detail. So those are the nerve poisons. So there's the axonic, 
poisons and the synaptic poisons. Then there are pesticides that affect other processes. And these can be varied, whether they be insect growth regulators, so that affect juvenile hormones, so that they, they mimic the German juvenile hormones so that it causes the problem, so it causes the molting to occur at the wrong time. When you rear insects, you normally, you know, an insect molts from one stage to the next. If it can't do that properly, it dies. And that happens in a, a natural setting without a pesticide occurring. If the juvenile hormones aren't quite right, that individual is pretty much going to die. Same thing, chitin synthesis. Chitin is in the exoskeleton. If it can't produce chitin in the way that it normally produces chitin, then the exoskeleton doesn't form properly and they'll probably uh, dehydrate or otherwise just die. They just can't function properly. They can't move their muscles because that's where the muscles attach to the exoskeleton. Then still other products will affect energy production on a molecular level. So um, has anybody heard of ATP, adenosine triphosphate? Couple, one, Natalie, Tony. So a couple, a few people. So ATP is basically the battery of cells. If you can't produce ATP, your cells don't get energy and you're going to die, effectively. That, in that insect will die. We have ATP as well. Many organisms, animals use ATP. Some insecticides affect muscle function so that the muscle is always contracted and can never relax. Obvious problems there if you're always contracting. Still others are stomach poisons and there are other modes of actions beside. Okay, now we're going to go into an example of the organophosphates and the carbamates because just about everyone will have used a 1A or a 1B product at some point. Who hasn't ever used a 1A or a 1B product? Raise your hand, please, and we'll continue. So what we've got here is a product that inhibits the neuro, the enzyme that detaches the neurotransmitter. What that means is when you've got this little receptor, it can't unbind. It basically, this cell will remain in constant stimulation. And if you're in constant stimulation, if the nerve cell is constantly be turn being turned on, then it can it causes, you see those insects that they're twitching on the ground, cockroaches with the stereotype, you know, cockroaches upside down, twitching, they can't function properly. And there are many different types of synapse poisons, and we're just going to move over to that um, no modes of action. Here we go. This is the, it'll move there in a second, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. It has a lot of information here. So all of these blue products are nerve or muscle poisons. And you can click on the info and it will give you a summary of the mode of action. So this one, it blocks a chloride channel, so it causes hyperexcitation and convulsions. So in effect, what you can summarize from that is the nerves don't function properly and it's overstimulus. What you have to remember is that in many cases, these nerve poisons can also act on the nerves of people. 
because there are some common elements. When there are those common elements between people and insects, and you'd be surprised how often that can occur, then it can be a major problem for you if you become exposed. Organophosphates, they're, that's part of the reason the safety is so important for these products and the, some of the other products because it can affect you. It can cause your nerves to become overstimulated and then you become the insect on the ground, so to speak. Other products, let's say the six, six products, so that's your, your abamectin, milvamectin, ivermectin, they act on a different type of molecular structure that people don't have. So the risk to people isn't as great as for some of the other nerve poison products. I'm not saying that it's going to have no effect because it still can potentially be poisonous in some other way, but it, uh, other way, but uh, the risk is lower. So and if we go down, you can see all the different mode of actions and the number represents the mode of action group. So different numbers have a different mode of action. So you've got the green ones here, they're juvenile hormone mimics, so they're growth regulators, IGRs. Some other products have unknown mode of actions. And you can see all the different colors. So you've got orange, they're, they're stomach or digestive, and they're active on the mid-gut. Uh, sometimes they affect respiration and so on and so forth. Okay, so th this is a pretty good resource if you want to understand a little bit more about insecticide mode of action. Do we have any, if you have any questions, then just type it into John and we can come back to this. All right, so we'll keep on going. All right, so now with that framework of understanding a little bit in summary of how pesticides work, we can understand a little bit better how pesticide resistance mechanisms occur. So there are four main ways in which insects and other invertebrates overcome pesticide modes of action. There's a metabolic resistance where they destroy, detoxify, or otherwise expel the toxin. And this is the most common me mechanism. And depending on the exact way that the foreign compound, the insecticide, is recognized and expelled or destroyed, it can potentially have an action against multiple pesticide mode of action. That's what the MOA stands for, mode of action. To go into details about the physiology of what that actually would be, is, is it, it's, it's too much for here, and you'd really want to be a detailed molecular physiologist to be able to do that. It's, it's beyond the scope, and honestly, I, I'd struggle sometimes. Okay, so we next have target site resistance. So what can happen here, if you remember that nerve cell diagram again, if the receptor organ is slightly different, then the pesticide can't bind to the target site. So you can imagine then that a, an insect or an individual that has very different target sites will have more resistance than an insect or an individual that has a, 
a target site that's only a little bit different. You also have a resistance where the toxin isn't absorbed through the cuticle, which is called penetration resistance. So it's having the pesticide move from the environment through the actual insect and have it occur, have it um, interact with that individual on a molecular level. And that also can be active against multiple pesticides. And when this type of resistance is present at the same time as some another type of resistance, which happens for some in some groups, some species more than others, you can have major problems and have resistance to a large number of pesticide mode of action groups. Two spotted mite is is probably in that category and the research shows that they're able to turn on different enzymes to to detoxify and destroy a lot of different types of pesticides. And lastly, the, the last major group of resistance is behavioral. So they have some way of going, ooh, there's a pesticide around. I'm, I'm getting out of here. They stop feeding. If it's something that's systemic in the plant, perhaps they taste it at that first instant or recognize that the insecticide has been applied to the plant and they either fly away, crawl away, whatever, go under, if they go, uh oh, there's a pesticide being applied, I can smell it in the air. I mean, we can smell it in the air, so it's no wonder the insects can too. Then they can try and hide, move deeper into the canopy, go to the underside of the leaf. And to a certain extent, that's part of the reason why you wanna get very good coverage. Obviously, there are other reasons. Okay, so that's pesticide resistance when we're talking about insects and mites mainly. Fungicides are a little bit more difficult. You can imagine an insect, we, in some ways we can relate to an insect because we are an individual. Our arms and our feet are all controlled by the nerve our nerve cells and the, the signaling in our body. Whereas a, a fungus is a bit different. I mean, it is a, a growth form that doesn't have a brain. And if you chop off a leaf halfway through that necrotic spot, let's say, it's still going to keep on growing. If you chop it off so that there's only a tiny little bit of it present, it's still going to keep on growing. So you have to affect the fungus, fungus on, a, on a cellular level and it has to get into the majority of the cells or all of the cells that are present. Does that make, just raise your hand if that makes sense. Because it is a little, I mean, when I was thinking about it, I just felt that it was, you had to get your head around this idea of being a fungus, which, yeah, we don't want to talk about it too much. <laughs> All right, thank you. A lot of you have raised your hand. Okay, so the older products, your copper products, your mancozeb, sulfur, who's seen that M, the big M on the label? You can raise your hand. Yep, a lot of you. Okay, good. So you can see those hands being raised. That M stands for multi-site activity. So they're, con they're contact products. They target a large number of physiological processes in the cell. Because they, and, and eventually, basically they stop that cell from reproducing. So when I say their contact activity, it has to contact the hyphae or the spores 
to have that activity in the cells. Because they affect a large number of cell processes, resistance rarely occurs. Now, if you put on a product often enough, you never say never when it comes to pesticide resistance. But the, we'll talk about this in more detail, the more modes of action you have acting on the target, the less likely you are to have an individual that's resistant against all of those modes of action. Okay, so those were the first type of pest, um, fungicides that were, were produced. More recently, we've had a lot of different products that have specific site activity. They target one aspect of cell physio physiology, and some of these products are systemic in the plant. So they'll move around the leaf or across the top or bottom of the leaf, or they might have a degree of systemic activity in the plant. So what I'm going, okay, yep, here we go, it's coming up. So these specific site activities can sometimes stop the synthesis of DNA and RNA, and that's bad news. I mean, most people are aware of every cell in our bodies has DNA and RNA. It helps keep our cells functioning properly. It allows the cells to reproduce. So if you can't make RNA or DNA, you're in big trouble. It, they can sometimes stop the cytoskeleton. So that is, cytoskeleton is the framework inside individual fungal cells that keeps it looking and being rigid. So we have a skeleton, it's similar. And in fact, our cells have a cytoskeleton as well, but that's all the fungi have because they obviously don't have bones. Some things can inhibit aspects of respiration. They can stop amino acid production or even induce host plant resistance. And there are many others. And what I'm gonna do is jump over to, first of all, this website, which has a lot of different information, including the pathogen risk list. Oops, that's not the one, this one. So this document, we're gonna go back to that, oh, that that poster in a moment and demystify it. But in any case, these are the types of fungi or the fungi species, fungal species that have been shown to have a high risk of developing pest, uh, fungicide resistance. So botrytis, alternaria, gummy stem blight, if you're growing cucurbits, and various downy mildews. Okay, then they've got those that have a medium risk, and there are more. And oftentimes these can be present in a nursery. So again, alternaria, different species, various different downy mildews, more various powdery mildews, and so on and so forth. And again, then we've got a low risk. So sclerotinia, sclerotium, rhizoctonia, and, and others, so various fusariums. I mean, I wouldn't recommend using a fungicide for fusarium anyway. Okay, so then that website also has a link to this poster. And what I want you to do is totally ignore all of the green boxes because you have to be a hardcore organochemist to understand, or maybe synthetic chemist, a hardcore molecular chemist, let's just leave it at that, to understand what those things mean. All I want you to do is look at A, nucleic acid synthesis, B, cytoskeleton and motor proteins, C, respiration, respiration, amino acid protein synthesis, and there are others, and you can see, and all of the different products should have the, that, that letter, 
on their label. And if you look at that and then you come here, you can get an idea of the type of pesticide or the type of fungicide you're dealing with. Does that sufficiently demystify that table? Raise, raise your, please raise your hand if, if it does. Okay, great. Because when I looked at it first time, I went, whoa. And then I looked at it a little more detail and went, oh, yeah, okay, that's not too bad. It shows that there's some variation in the different products. But ultimately, they're all doing the same thing. Okay, great. John, did you have something to add to that? No? All right. Okay, so now we have an idea of the types of ways fungicides can act on fungi. And I can see that we're, we're getting close to 11, so I'll keep it moving. There are four main mechanisms for resistance. Changing the target site. Similar to the insects, if the target site is different in the fungus, then the fungicide can't attach to it and cause the problem and so it keeps on growing. Detoxifying so that it's no longer toxic. Sometimes fungi actually overexpress an aspect of the physiology so that it doesn't matter that the pesticide is acting upon that target. So imagine you've got a pesticide, it's going into the cells, it locks onto 100% of the target spot. All of that fungus is going to die. Whereas if it produces a thousand percent, let's say, I'm not sure exactly on what percentage it would be, but let's say, for instance, it's a thousand percent of that target, maybe that pesticide now only locks on to 25% of the target. And so the cell can continue to function normally. And so you can imagine that those, those strains or fungal colonies that overexpress more of that target site will have a greater resistance to the fungicide. So fungi, all fungi have cells to pump out foreign substances. Now, in most instances, they don't really need to have a huge number of these pumps. There aren't many foreign substances going into the fungus, so they don't need very many. But when it comes to a fungicide, it's being applied if, it, if you have a strain, again, that has heaps of those pumps, it can get rid of the fungicide so quickly that it doesn't affect the cells. And it can then potentially result in multiple resistance. So resistance to many different types of products. Okay, how do people go? Does that make sense? Please raise your hand. Okay, does anybody wanna, that's great. So I see a lot of people raising your hand. Does anybody want more detail on this? Okay, I'll keep on going. And we have the question time anyway. Questions? So, John, have we received any questions? We have, Andrew. We've got a couple here. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I hope you can. Yeah, I can. Um, with, um, mul I guess it's in relation to your multi site resistance and whether you can, is there mm -hmm. a chance of getting cross resistance mm -hmm. with using different. Mm -hmm pesticides, whether it be, I guess, insecticide or fungicides, they just had pesticides. So what, yes. what can you talk, I guess, say about cross resistance? Okay, so cross resistance occurs when you have two different pesticides, they might have two different mode of actions, but they act in a similar kind of way, perhaps if, if you remember, maybe it's actually easiest to go back to the modes of action here. Okay, so we've got those that inhibit acetylcholine. Okay, and then we come back down here. Um, um, this 
sodium channels, chloride channels, um, binds to acetylcholine. So sometimes if you've got the pesticide that acts on acetylcholine, perhaps the resistant mechanism, it changes maybe the receptor. And if it changes the receptor enough, it might then have resistance to both of those mechanisms just by chance because it was it had the selection pressure so hard on one of them that it, maybe there was a large change just by chance in, in the frequency of these resistance traits in the population such that it has affected both of them. Does that make sense? Yep, I think that's Absolutely. pretty clear. Okay. Now, in the interest one of, the other of yep. Yeah, one of the other questions yep. was in relation to your ATP. Um, mm -hmm. just, I know that's a relation to the energy transfer, but I can't recall whether you actually mentioned what ATP stood for. Okay, so ATP is adenosine triphosphate. The exact and mechanism is a little bit complicated. Yeah. But effectively, the ATP, <laughs> they, it, the energy is stored in ATP by putting the third phosphate molecule onto that ATP. So it's ADP, so it has two, when there are two phosphate molecules, it doesn't store as much energy. But as soon as the third one goes on, it stores lots of energy. And then when the that third phosphate molecule is removed, it releases that energy. So if you, yep, if you stop, yeah, if you, it's obvious, if you stop the ATP from forming, forming, it can't release the energy in the right way. Yep, no, that's okay. good. That's what the question was all about. Thanks, Andrew. No worries. Okay, so this is the last section and we're going to go through that and hopefully we won't go too much over time. History of pesticide resistance management and some current best practice management. So first of all, let's have a poll real quick. Yep. What Here sorts of actions do you do to actively avoid pesticide resistance? So what I'm thinking, you might apply to hotspots anyway, but maybe you're not actually doing it from the point of view of pesticide resistance. If you're doing it with the framework in your head, you're thinking, I'm doing this so I don't have to deal with pesticide resistance, then tick those boxes and otherwise type into the chat. So we'll just click, click them real quick, maybe 30 seconds or 20 seconds and we'll move on and close the poll and we can talk about some of those results perhaps um, to, at the end so that we don't go too far over time. Okay, yep, pesticide rotation is the biggest one. A little bit of some of the others. All right, John, three, two, one. <laughs> All right, and we had, most, we had most we people answer. Okay, great. All right, we're gonna keep on moving. Can you hide that poll, please, John? Yep. Trying to, yeah, there you go. Off you go. All right. So the first accounts of pesticide resistance were, were published just before 1900. And they, there were a few more around 1910. And it didn't really, you can see from this table that it didn't really become massively prevalent until the mid 50s. And then there was a boom, just went up massively where people were constantly relying on pesticides, particularly in broad acre, uh, in, in broad acre cropping systems. They're just spraying and spraying and spraying, causing huge selection pressure for, for those populations and the pesticide resistance was going nuts. So as a result of that, the first thing that happened was rotating be between two mode of action groups. At the time, mid fifties, there weren't very many mode of action groups. I think there are only a, a handful. John, you might know more about that. 
um, but I, I don't. So, but it doesn't matter. Um, then they started using a range of other things because they realized that two, just relying on the pesticide wasn't enough. And what they would do in those broad acre plant uh, cropping systems, they'd have a refuge of susceptible or unsprayed crop, and then the majority being sprayed. So the idea is that you get a few individuals that are resistant in the sprayed area, and a large number of individuals, excuse me, sorry, a large number of individuals that come out of the unsprayed area or the untreated areas that was susceptible. If there are lots of susceptible individuals, well, relatively speaking, compared to the one or two resistant individuals, they interbreed and the, the resistance is diluted out. We, we mentioned that earlier. Then we started to get other types of resistance management actions coming out, a mixture of mode of action groups. And this, these things are still valid. You have with products like Movento and, and a lot of different fungicides, they'll have more than one mode of action group. The idea is that it's rare to have individuals that have both a resistance to both of those mode of actions. And theoretically, when models have been done on, on comparing mixtures to rotation, the mixtures work better. But there is general skepticism, and there's reason for that, particularly where you have, an, have a population that might have a low level of resistance to one of those mode of action groups, then the mixtures don't work so well. And if you keep on applying that same mixture, then you get a high selection pressure for resistance to both of them, and it still potentially can occur. So you still have to keep that in the back of your mind. Then particularly in the broad acre, there were also people that were doing a mosaic. So they would spray product 1A on that field and then spray uh, 4A on that field. And of course, the ones that survive, they intermix. And again, the resistance to both of those products are diluted down. Probably not so important for a nursery setting, but it helps to keep it in, my, in the back of your mind that there are more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak. Now, limited sequential usage. Uh, is anyone familiar with Spinosad or su Success Neo? It's a, uh, an insecticide that is particularly good for things like uh, caterpillars and uh, some Western flower thrips and uh, various other different insecticides. It has a specific insecticide resistance management strategy on it that says spray this product three times a week apart, about a week, week to 10 days apart, and then don't use it for the rest of the cropping season. That's limited sequential usage, and that's sort of a, a window effect, which we'll, we'll talk about more now. So. Currently, we still do all those things that we've talked about, but we've added other things because we realize the more you spray, the more likely you are to have pesticide resistance as a, as a risk. So how do we reduce the amount that we apply pesticides? We monitor to know when you have the high risk periods. So instead of spending your time spraying, you're spending your time working out where the problem is when I have the problem, targeted monitoring, knowing when things are, knowing the plants that are susceptible, knowing uh, the seasons where that crop is most likely to be susceptible, 
and monitoring it more closely and applying the pesticides when the pests are at low population levels. So you don't have to spray as much. It's easy to get rid of them. So the pesticides are a component of the management plan. You're not relying on pesticides alone. And most people I would imagine, if you can raise your hand, would be doing this already, even if it's not specifically to, for pesticide resistance management. Okay, as we've talked about choosing appropriate products, targeting the vulnerable life stage. So this is not always straightforward, particularly where the damage is only visible after the vulnerable life stage has been and gone. Who's experienced that? Um, just raise your hand. Things like galling insects, oftentimes it's a so aphids that cause, uh, at low levels, you've got a lot of raised hands. I don't need to go into it any further. Okay, you know what we're going on about. Okay, you can apply to hotspots. So if you apply it to the hotspots, those areas that are only going to receive economic damage, then the, the low levels of that species in other areas are still around, but they're not affecting the crop. And you don't have to spray as often. They interbreed and dilute this resistance out. Equipment calibration is something that I think is probably overlooked. Who would say they calibrate their, their pesticide equipment every year, at least once a year? Raise your hand, please. One. Two, okay, two, three of 15. All right, so equipment calibration is important for you know, somewhat obvious reasons. It, it puts the right amount of product on to the crop. If it's not calibrated properly, you can, you can get product failure quite easily and um, it, it effectively can potentially increase the number of pesticides applications that you have to make and increase the risk of inducing pesticide resistance. Okay, so adequate spacing, another, another one particularly important in a nursery for more than one reason, I mean, obviously there's the cultural management to reduce things like fungal leaf spots and, and other, and other um, diseases, but there's also the aspect of being able to cover your crop with the pesticide more easily. You have better coverage, you're more likely to get a high kill level and less likely to induce pesticide resistance. Okay, given the time, I'm going to um, just skip over some of these things. It's pretty obvious, some of these first two. Growing healthy plants, that's simply growing a healthy plant. You're more likely to have a plant that can withstand and recover from damage. Um, so you're less likely to have to apply a pesticide as often. Removing weeds, so this is where populations of particularly insects and sometimes viruses can be harbored in the nursery. So if you have an area of the nursery that has heaps of weeds, you're more like, probably more likely to have some uh, pests. You may get some predators, but you're also gonna have a lot of pests. I would rather see you guys have gardens with flowering plants that are managed without the pest so to encourage your natural enemies. Discard the unsalable plants. It's really obvious, and you guys know it already, but I want to highlight it because if you leave plants in the crop that are infested with a pest or a disease, and it's not going to be salable anyway, the only thing that's going to happen is increase the risk of spreading that pest or pathogen to other plants in the nursery. So it's a big no-no. You want to slap your hand if you do that. Everything in terms of these cultural management strategies are designed to break the life cycle 
in the nursery. So if you have a continuous population of a pest or pathogen in the nursery, you're more likely to have pesticide resistance occur because it's going to have a selection pressure uh, assuming that you are applying pesticides on a regular basis to try and get rid of it. Whereas if you break the entire life cycle for a period of time and then there's a reintroduction from outside, there is a greater chance that you're get dealing with individuals that are resistant to a pesticide. Now there are obviously exceptions. Um, does, is anybody in Virginia, in you know, town south? If in certain areas, in high cropping areas where there is a particularly vegetables, not that I want to point any fingers, but there are areas where there's a high cropping zones and pesticides just run rife, you potentially can be getting resistant individuals into your nursery. Yeah, I see, I, I see um, one raised hand there and I feel sorry for you. Um, no, we've, we've spoken before. <laughs> I think you so, have to Andrew, have a... It, too, okay. Yes, so you have, yeah, I'm here. But you have to have a slightly um, different way of thinking. Sorry, John, I'm speaking over you. Um, if you're in those sort of a zones. Yes, John? I think if if, if the nursery is accredited, um, either NICE or otherwise, they should be doing a lot of these practices anyway, um, which will yes, help absolutely. reduce any resistance build up. That's exactly right. And you don't have to be NIASA accredited to be doing these things. So the, that, that's, that's good. But I do, I want to promote it. Just I'm not speaking against the NIASA. I'm fully supportive of the NIASA program, and I recommend everyone to investigate uh, getting on board. So current best practices, where there is a pesticide resistance manage, management strategy on the label, always follow it. But if there's not, then you can rotate between different products, different mode of action groups over the entire season. And this is particularly recommended when you're dealing with pests that are long lived. Um, so then what you're doing is you're reducing the risk of inducing the pesticide resistance. Where you have pesticides with multiple and overlapping generations in a, within a crop season, then perhaps you'd be better off spraying in that window zone. So you go two to three applications of one mode of action group, a, a product of one mode of action group, and then two to, two to three applications of a different mode of action group, and don't repeat those that mode of action group until the next cropping season. And you've got to temper that with the break in the life cycle in the nursery. So you might you might know in the back of your mind, okay, yeah, I'm in a different cropping season because I've gotten rid of those plants, but my population is still there and it hasn't stopped. So you might in the in your head you might extend the cropping season over two um, crop lines. Hope does that make sense? I don't have any hands, but I'm, yeah, a few hands now. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, so we're going to have a quick worked example, and then we're going to finish aphids. So once again, we're going to implement as many cultural management strategies as possible. So you're reducing your pest populations, or reducing the risk of having a pest population. You're going to monitor more during the high risk periods. You're going to promote biological, so predators or introduce predator, predators so that potentially you don't have to apply a pesticide at all and hopefully you don't have a situation like we have in the picture here where the person has sprayed a pesticide and also sprayed all the mummies which release uh, uh, parasitoids which then kill the aphids. So they probably didn't need to spray because there were hardly any living uh, aphids compared to the parasitized aphids. So that comes back to your monitoring. If populations increase to levels that damage is going to occur, then we look at the minor use permit 81707, which has a lot of different mode of action groups for non-food nursery stock. Now, there are other labels that have 
some of these different products. But that what I could find is that permit was the best thing out there. So obviously you've got to keep that in mind if you're in Victoria, it's, it's not as relevant, but it's still a good guideline. So these four active ingredients at the top here, they are ones that are relatively soft on predators. So if you are trying to maintain a population of predators, then these are the ones to rotate between. And they all have some guidelines over how many times you can use that product per season. So you want to keep that in mind when you are making your plan. You go, you need to keep that practical aspect in your mind and go, okay, how much does this thing cost? How much is it going to affect my crops? Do I need to make those purchases? And so on and so forth. I'm, I, don't, I don't need to go any, into any more detail. But these actives down here, they have high activity against predators. So the predators that are there, if you start spraying these products, you're probably not going to have predators around unless you're only spraying them to a hot spot. Okay, and there's a link to, to 81707, but if you just do mining use permit 81707 and you'll get this. And it has a whole range of products available for many different pests. Okay, that's the end of the webinar. I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit over time. Do we have any further questions or comments? We have a, <clears throat> we have a couple, Andrew. Um, I guess one is, okay. how how long does it take for resistance to develop um, but if you're using mm -hmm. the same product over and over? Okay. That The only way to answer that question is it depends. It depends on the pest you have that you're dealing with. Certain pests, particularly things like two-spotted mite, western flower thrips, things like also diseases like botrytis, they have a high propensity for pesticide resistance. So you may find that there's a low level of resistance that's actually difficult to detect in the population in the nursery already. And then when you apply a product to it, it, it can a, it seem to appear quite quickly, maybe even after only a couple applications. Has anybody had experience like that? Just raise your hand. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, okay, there's been a couple. So, whereas if you're dealing with a pest, particularly let's say a native pest on a native plant, in the general environment, it might be growing around your nursery, you're more likely to be having endemic, the endemic population coming into your nursery on a regular basis. You might, you might never, ever see any evidence of pesticide resistance, even if you were spraying on a regular basis, simply because that population is diluted out. Now, I wouldn't recommend spraying and spraying and spraying, but it's just a worked example that that sort of thing is possible. And I guess I'm sorry that I can't be more that... specific. And I guess yeah. that leads on to the last question, which we probably have is you're talking about mixtures. <clears throat> um, uh -huh. How many products can you actually mix safely um, in one batch? Ooh. I know we recommend Look, that you don't have too many mixtures, but um, I guess when you're looking at different John, kinds of actions, you can put at least two, but yeah. I would say that you're better at answering that question than I am. <laughs> it, I guess it does depend on the label as some, someone's just put through. If you are looking at mixing more than one or two products, check the label out because they do have on there a compatibility with other products. If it's not there, it's always a good idea to check out the chemical company's website or that product's website that will give you more information on what products you can mix and which ones you can't. 
There are some products when you mix, they do form or coagulate in this spray tank, and so they just settle out, and you will essentially just be spraying water onto your crop. If you're unsure, you can always spray a few plants, a small area, see what happens within 24 hours, whether you get a burning effect on the foliage or some other effect. And if that happens, then you know not to mix those products together. It does vary. The only thing I'll add to that is I'm aware that there is a process that you can do to test these things, an order in which to add different types of products together to have the least risk of having a failed uh, pesticide and having those coagulants form. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but I know that it is available online if you look for it. And it could be within All those right. websites All right. that we put up. Yep. Okay, well, I think we've come to the end. Thank you very much, everyone, we... for attending. I, I know a few of you have already left, but um, thanks once again. Um, I hope you've learned a fair lot, a fair bit from this. This will be up on the YouTube channel shortly uh, once Andrew um, gets it all sorted. Yeah. And if you need any other help, you can contact Grow Help or Andrew or myself, and I'm sure we'll be able to help you as much as we can. So now I'll just add to this. I was, I was hope, yep, I was hoping to have a survey out later today, but it's um, unfortunately some circumstances have occurred that I'm probably not going to. It'll be early next week, so after the long weekend. Okay. It'll just Again, be short. Thanks, just everyone. Be short. Thank you very much. And yes, have a good Easter. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.